So for context, this video is Australia's Indigenous Minister, Linda Burney, after they legislated the fact that the referendum for voice to parliament for First Nations people, um, yeah, they legislated the referendum in parliament, so that should be happening in a couple of months. And this is her addressing what's called the National Press Club, which is pretty much a circle jerk of all the media, of all people in the media. And really, it's uh, just standing up and addressing the people, and really addressing the people in Australia as well. Um, yeah, so... Thank you so much um, for uh, that welcome. And it was wonderful to be at the NAIDOC Ball in Brisbane on Saturday night to see Aunty Matilda get the uh, Female Elder of the Year. And I have to say, absolutely deserved. So another clap. Balam Ambo Nano Naran Nambri Yinyamara. I can't hear myself. Naju Yerabang Marang. In the language of my people, the Wiradjuri, I pay respect to the Nano and Nambri people and honor their custodianship and care for country. And I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today from all points. You have to stop when the tram stops. That's what I learned in Melbourne. I want to acknowledge my dear friend Jed Carney. Uh, or just Horsten go around like an Smith, asshole. Mark Stewart. Um, the wonderful Artie Geraldine Atkinson. Wow, this game actually has a speed limit. Uh, and, and of, of course... Justin Mohammed, our first First Nations ambassador ever. So a huge congratulations to Justin. <laughs> but most importantly, happy NAIDOC, everyone. The happy theme NAIDOC. this year is for our elders. In his landmark speech, Beyond the Morning Gate, delivered in 2000. The Father of Reconciliation, my dear friend, Sir Patrick Dodson, used the term unfinished business. The unfinished business of our failure to recognise Indigenous Australians who had coexisted on this continent for more than 65,000 years. Now, 122 years after the Australian Constitution was formed, more than 80 years since William Cooper uh, had his petition, 35 years since the Barunga Statement, 30 years since Keating's Redfern speech, 16 years since John Howard promised a referendum to recognize, for recognition, 15 years since the apology, 13 years since the expert panel on constitutional recognition, and six years, everyone. It's been a long year. It's been a long time. Statement from the heart. Doesn't feel like it all the time, but must surely be asked. Sure. How much longer to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? have to wait Just for recognition. I'm paying you to when will we that. finally resolve this unfinished business? Look at him out there. As Pat the Anderson said, let's lazy. finish Give the unfinished excuse. business the between us help. all. The work is always there. If Just not now, when? You're a busy guy. We I don't see so Damn, this is really badly optimized. Our destination so is on the horizon. Crash. So yeah, we are I just a few busy. short months away from realizing the promise of the Uluru Statement. You. 
that historic First Nations consensus on the way forward, where 250 Indigenous leaders and elders gathered in the red dirt at Ul I will say it's not a consensus, obviously there's people who believe that this isn't the right way or there's not extreme enough or it's too much, but I think there was a large portion of the people at the Uluru Statement that believed that this was the way forward, that um, the implementation details that had been suggested would be good, and that just the general sentiment of a voiced parliament was the right way, and that it should be constituted due to, in the past, there being voices to parliament in the same implementation sense, yet they've been removed by parliamentary, by governments, by elected governments, and what the First Nations are saying is that that shouldn't be able to happen, that they should always have a voice to parliament and to our nation. to issue the statement from the heart. The idea of constitutional recognition for a voice is what Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have asked for themselves, have asked for, not the government. Later this year, Australians, you will be asked a simple question. Do you support a change to the Constitution to recognise the First Peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Yes or no? Canada recognised First, First Nations people in the 1980s. New Zealand, the Crown recognised the Māori people as far back as 1840. In 2023, if I don't it build a is time for Australia we'll to recognise Indigenous Australians. The first and question I want to address here. today hey, is why simple. is the voice needed? Never of them. And the simple answer Who's is the because the gap is been closing fast enough. True. For far too it's long, moving. governments have places. made policies I'm for Indigenous and Australians. And not but it's not being represented by indigenous. We need a voice to change yeah, that. We need flesh. the voice because we need to work in partnership with communities. Yep. We need a voice because we need to do better. Mm -hmm. And we particularly need to do better by young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people more than half of all Indigenous Australians are under the age of 25. But our young people don't start on a level playing field. They need hope. They need opportunities for parents and elders their parents and elders did not have. They need a voice. Consider this. And please stand in these shoes. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are 55 times more likely to die from rheumatic heart disease than non-Indigenous people. These deaths are completely preventable. With access to medical care, proper housing and clean running water. Indigenous young people are 24 times more likely to be locked up than their neighbours. In the words of the Uluru Statement, we are not an innately criminal people. First Nations children represent 37% of all children removed from their parents, but make up only 6% of Australia's children. This number is unacceptably high. And yet the number of yep. Indigenous children living in out-of-home care 
is expected to double in the next six years. And this cannot because we have no love for them. Our people are more likely to have experienced homelessness than to hold an undergraduate degree. That's really bad. In 2020, the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people locked up in a prison cell was four times as many as those who celebrated the graduating university that year. Four times as many of our people with despair rather than hope for their future. Does this mean that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have no aspirations no. and dreams for the better, a better future? Of course not. This is systemic and structural disadvantage. The suicide rate of our people is almost twice the rate of our fellow Australians. All these numbers sometimes obscure the fact this is about real people, real people with families and loved ones, real people like Michael Riley. Michael grew up in poverty in Dubbo during the 1960s. He spent time on Talbragar Reserve, an overcrowded place with terrible conditions. At least we could build. And medical and medical medical care was almost. Yeah, I really think to listen to this and not agree that First Nations people need help. You have to, you have to lack some amount of humanity to not get that and to not care and to vote no. It's almost an appeal to emotion. Maybe that's a bit extreme. Like, how, how much can you really value a constitution over thousands of people, of people, they're people, over thousands of people's lives. We don't, like, Australia doesn't, has never given a fuck about their constitution. We don't care. We're not like America. So the idea that now that we want to include Indigenous people in it with a right, with a constitutional right for representation, and now everyone's coming out of the woodworks and saying, no, the Constitution, the Constitution, constitutional law. Like, idiots who, like, work down at some fucking, I don't know. A meaningless job has nothing to do with law, and suddenly they're experts on constitutional law, but they're not. It's just that the media is saying, "Hey, well, we need to be careful. We need to be careful of the constitution." Well, you don't get to fuck about the constitution. So we'll see. I'd, I'm not optimistic about the outcome of the referendum, but. All we can do is wait and see and talk to people that you know about why this needs to go ahead, what it really means, not what the media is saying it means. It really isn't that impactful on everyday life for white Australians, but it will be impactful on some level to all Indigenous and First Nations people. non-existent, like so many That's others scary. who were forced to live yeah. in these poor conditions. Michael suffered from chronic infection. He got rheumatic, rheumatic fever, a condition which his immune system never recovered. Michael became a renowned photographer and his work was shown throughout the world. At the peak of his career, at the age of 44, he died of end-stage renal failure. 
I was very close to Michael. I visited him every day in hospital. I watched him go blind in one eye. What do they call you? His aberginality condemned to an early death, a preventable death. I'm just going to pause it while this cutscene goes on. My cab got smashed up pretty good. Morello's thugs went after him. I was kind of Tommy helping us. Is this the taxi? That's your livelihood? Yes, sir. I feel a sense of responsibility here. So I'm going to set you up with a small loan. Enough to get that cab. Ugh. No, nah, fuck off. It's not a handout, it's a loan. Then what are we doing here? I just want a shot at the bastards who wrecked my cat. <laughs> you hear that, Frank? The kid wants my permission to get into a fight. Yes, I heard. Okay, Tommy Angelo. All the Morellas girls hang out at a bar, you know. Paul, you know the place. Sure do, boss. Damn, this is like some combination of uh <laughs> of the Sopranos and Peaky Blinders. Smash up a few tin cans, send Morello a message. He can't rough up hard-working Joes in my neighborhood without getting a black eye. Thank you, Mr. Serio. I won't let you down. And Tom, when you get back, we'll talk about what's next for you. knows you here so tread careful okay all right we'll get started back on this video yeah. i remember being by his bedside with his cousin Lynette when he passed i remember the injustice of it and it's what still motivates me to this day it's what motivates me every day to put one front foot in front of the other to do, do better by Indigenous Australians, to do better for future generations, and we can uh, prohibition. do better. Just last month, we saw new data that showed four of the 19 closing the gap targets were on track. Just four out of 19. Life expectancy not on track. Indigenous babies born with healthy birth weights, not on track. Finishing year 12, not, not on, on track. track. Indigenous people engaged in job, jobs and training, not on track. If we needed any more evidence that more of the same isn't good enough, then this is it. We have to do things better. And I honestly believe the voice can help. We have everything to gain and nothing to lose by supporting the voice. Because the voice will be a mechanism for government and the parliament to listen. It will be like a resource of local knowledge and solutions that can help make us better and help make better policies. Yeah, the general, I uh, yeah, the overarching idea is that for decades, even two centuries, well, since we've been here, we've been, you know, as a government, I guess since 1901, since Australia became a federation and became its own country outside of the British, that's when we can start taking blame. That is the end of when you can blame colonialism. That's my belief. You can't blame colonialism on stuff that Australia, as its own individual nation, has committed. You can't blame the stolen generation on colonialism. You tackle that as a united nation of both European Australians and first Australians. But for decades and over a century, we've 
been overrepresented overrepresented in our parliament as leaders of our nations and we've built policies and solutions for first nation people who have been underperforming against western standards and it hasn't well it has improved their lives but not at the same rate as it has say a white person's or a western australian so the question is is what is the solution to that we've tried and tried and tried maybe with good intentions some with good intentions some with bad intentions against the policies that we've created for First Nations people. So if the good intentioned policies aren't working, why is that? What the First Nation leaders have proposed is that because the leaders of, say, our parliament don't understand the culture and lives of First Nation people, it's almost impossible for them to construct good policy to help them. Thus, what they have proposed is that similar to advisory boards in the past, where we've had the NAC, the NACC, which is, don't confuse the NACC with the Anti-Corruption Committee that we now have. The NACC used to be the National Aboriginal Something Conference. Um, and that used to be an advisory board that got elected in similar ways there were issues with it we know the issues with it we can improve based on the feedback we got during the last time we had an advisory board for indigenous issues ran by First Nations people John Howard when he was at the end of his term Got rid of it as per a um, as per a study done, but the study also said that there was something that should have replaced it. I'll go read that study at one point. We'll see how we go. And nothing ever replaced it. So for now, fifteen years, we've not had any rep any representation in Parliament outside of indigenous ministers but they are they're only there as representatives of their electorates and they're also only there as the party sees fit that they're a suitable candidate for political power they're not there for the good of First Nation people. Personally, they might be, but as soon as the Parliament sees that they're not worth it anymore, uh, not the Parliament, the party, they're axed. And they'll be replaced by someone, whether they're First Nations or European Australians. So, the solution is an advisory board of elected First Nation people, elected by First Nation people. The First Nation leaders elected by First Nation people. And the joke of like having it just being like, oh well Indigenous ministers are fine. That's where Tony Abbott got put back when he lost his leadership. That was the backbench position that he ended up in. That's how little, say, a Liberal Party cares about Indigenous affairs. That's where they put the leaders who they don't want causing any trouble. So when someone says, oh, but we, you know, we have ministers for this that handle all the policy for Indigenous people, it's not good enough. We make First Nations issues a constitutional issue, thus... It becomes a voting issue for representatives. Will you uphold the advice that First Nations representatives are giving you? 
If not, then we are not going to vote for you. If the, if the electorate doesn't care, the electorate doesn't care. But what the First Nations and Uluru Statement think is that people will care. Because Australians are inherent, are good people. Not inherently, but are good people. They trust that. So they trust that the referendum is going to go through. They trust once the referendum has gone through and the implementation is legislated, that the Australian people, both European and First Nations, will ensure that governments in the future will uphold the advice given to them by Indigenous the First Nations voice. That's that's the whole idea. Yeah. That's it. The great leader of the Gummich clan of North Eastern Arnhem Land, the late Yunipingu once said, they do not listen because they do not have to. It was the truth. Governments don't have to listen, whether it be local, state, or federal government. If that don't work out for My you, predecessor, Ken White, put it well, reflecting on his time. Ken Wyatt, who left the Liberal Party over their issues with the First Nation voice. As a minister, when he said, one, one key areas of health and education, I saw no reflection of Aboriginal input in the, into the discussions that led to legislation being put to the parliament and the party room. Because the Liberals did not care about First Nations people. Everyone knows that. It's not new. The voice is about advice. Since 1967, when the Commonwealth... I think a lot of people are worried about how that voice is going to matter to the government. What if the government doesn't care? But the fact about why we make it a constitutional right is that it becomes an election issue, whether you're not caring about what is constitutionally given to us. Gain powers to make, to make laws for Aboriginal people. Governments have tried to develop some sort of consultative mechanism. All right, correction there. We've only been making laws for Indigenous people since 1970. The reason for that is because since 1970, that's like we've only sort of acknowledged that Aboriginal people are people since 1970. So I guess that makes sense. We're not just ignoring them anymore. And many haven't worked. The second question I want to answer today is how will the voice work? First. Let's be clear about what the voice is, how it will help to deliver a better future and do better than past bodies. The voice will be independent, representative advisory body made up of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The voice will be nimble, efficient and focused on making a practical difference. That is what Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have asked for, to be heard. It will be chosen by local communities for local communities. The voice will give independent advice to Parliament and the government on issues affecting Indigenous people and communities. This will lead to better outcomes because we know that listening to people from the grassroots levels lead to better outcomes. Yeah. The voice will provide independent advice for better decisions. It will empower local voices. Every state, territory, the Torres Strait Islands and remote communities will be represented. It will be gender balanced and include the views of young people. It will consult with local communities. It will be accountable and transparent, and it will cooperate with existing organisations. One question I'm sometimes asked is, 
who want to buy them. Why does the voice need to be in the Constitution? Mm. Uh, Why can't it I'm just no be legislated? I used to sit back well, there are two main reasons, everyone. Firstly, so a now. voice or representative body cannot be truly independent or give Boss, frank advice to, to the government of the day. If the government of the day can abolish it, yep, 100%. Not even pre-watched. And secondly, it's what First Peoples requested in the Uluru Statement from the Heart. It's the starting point for reconciliation has to be listening to the wishes of Indigenous people. The starting point cannot be a political fix made in Canberra. No. That's not real trouble. reconciliation. Trouble Let me give you three examples of how the voice will work <laughs> in a practical way. Me. Practical, well, practical, practical. practical. Let your face. Let's say a local community so hard, identifies a problem like, like, like low school attendance. The community identified, identifies that, that's the, that this is a challenge challenge and wants to explore local solutions to improve school attendance. So the community approaches their representative on The Voice and raises this, ish, this issue with them. The Voice then has the power to make representations on how to improve school attendance at the local community level to government and the parliament. It's about linking up the local decisions decision making and local knowledge with policy makers and government. Let me give you another area where I think the voice can make an important practical difference. The Community Development Program or the CDP. CDP was designed in 2015. It was meant to be an employment and training scheme that also contributed, to, contributed to remote communities. CDP supports around 40,000 people Again, across 1,000 communities. There's some kind of line In the recent and years, it's been a failure. It's been criticised for not so being general, responsive to local, local communities and actually standing in the way of jobs and economic development. And and one yep. size does not fit all. Else. Simply, it simply didn't work across 1,000 communities. Residents of remote communities have told me they want skills to work okay, as mechanics and to run the local butcher or the bakery. But despite asking for this, despite wanting to work to improve their community, governments have failed to listen. I believe the voice can play a key role and helping to fix CDP. To ensure that it's fit for purpose, we know that listening works. We know it delivers practical outcomes. Let's take another example, birthing on country. Aboriginal community controlled health organisations have pioneered a more effective way of caring for mums and babies one that embraces tradition yes, and language okay. so that oh, mothers I feel safe accessing medical services early and often, and by respecting and elevating the role of the extended family. Birthing on country is, uh, has proven absolutely that there has, there has been uh, a 50% cut in a uh, 50% cut in babies being born early. Achieving this has been a real success. In the words of my friend Julian Lesser, the voice can help you us to understand better what's going on on the ground and help ensure that better policy is made that's more responsive to community. Or to put it another way, Doctors get better outcomes when they listen to patients. Bosses get better outcomes when they listen to workers. Policy makers that get, get, get better outcomes 
when they listen to First Nations community. Much has been made of the proactive representations the voice will make to Parliament and the government. Bring the priorities to local of local communities to Canberra will be incredibly important. So will be the request government, the government makes to the voice. With this, everyone, will be a step change in our ability to deliver evidence-based policy. Policy that is supported by community and makes a practical difference. From day one, the voice will have a very full in-tray. I will ask the voice to consider four main priority areas, health, education, jobs, and housing. The voice will be tasked with taking the long view. Unlike government, it will not be distracted by th three year election cycles. It will plan for the next generation, hey, not the next God. term. It will be focused on making a better future for the next generation. The time to make a generational difference, everyone, is now. We live in an aging country. Overall, less than a third of Australians are under 25. However, that rises to more than half for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. In the decades ahead, the cost of and the consequence of re repeating the same mistakes will be amplified. So, so too will the benefits if we listen and do things better. I want the voice to come up with fresh ideas, fresh ideas that can guide us over the long term. As the minister, when I meet for the first time with the voice, I will say, bring me your ideas on how we stop our people from taking their own lives. Bring me your ideas on how to help our kids go to school and thrive. Bring me your ideas on, we on how to make sure our mob live healthy, happy lives. How we ensure more people have jobs with independent, independence and purpose, and with the independence and purpose that brings, how we strengthen culture and language, how we, sort, we support our families better, how we keep alive 65,000 years no of culture and make it stronger. I'll be asking the voice for their input to solve these most pressing issues. So there will be important work in the voices in trade from day one. It's sure. not going to be a passive advisory body. I want it to be active. I want it to be engaged. We need new perspective to old challenges. Perspectives that are connected to, to communities. We need ideas that come from the people on the ground. We need a voice. As my trailblazing sister, June Oscar, puts it, hey, an Indigenous body gives us an opportunity to elevate our day, voices in the country while we months. occupy a space yeah. on the fringe of Maybe government policy. Yep. A, go a voice that gives us the ability to address Parliament directly, deals, directly through our connections to our yeah. communities and our regions. Now, I also want to say a few You'll words about the new campaign. And one day I found myself in a yard behind a bar drawing <laughs> The new campaign is being run by a group so called Fair Australia. So <laughs> it is important Trump style politics to uh, Australia. That's a bit rough. It is post truth. And its aim is to polarize. Its aim is to sow division in our, in our society. Although, actually, I would say the idea about um, that the voice to parliament was going to become a third chamber of parliament and that it could veto anything that it deemed white supremacist, which they use as like a anything to do with race, 
is that was dirty off the street i'm thinking we get in front of the boss including providing including oh, that providing advice so to government would somehow impact the fundamental democratic principle yes. of one vote one value yep no a claim it won't designed to mislead my social media as you can imagine attract trolls who accuse me of things like trying to set up an apartheid state Ugh. last month Pauline Hanson went on radio. Fuck Pauline Hanson. God and damn. said that she had met a true black. Oh, she no. This is unimaginably um, racist. Insulting. Yeah. And uh, deserving of anything is really beyond the pale. Because what she was saying is that some indigenous people. Ah, oh, true indigenous people. Of our identity. Yep. To say it was uh, uh, to say it was an That's insult is an un understatement. I'm a businessman. Yeah, um, indigenous identity is so difficult in Australia. It's always hilarious listening to Americans talk about like mixed race people and you know how mixed and what you get out of this and that and I, I, I it maybe in America it happens for native Indians and I'm sure it happens in Canada for their first nation people it definitely happens in Australia where to to like if you're a white person by appearance be like you you've got no like people just won't straight up won't believe you but also there are a lot of government grants and it's kind of hard to prove whether you're actually first nations in australia it's sort of just like a if you've been accepted by an indigenous community, then you're considered to be First Nations. Um, I also believe that there is a uh, there is a cutting off point, so I think it's um your great grandfather or great great grandfather is the cutting off point. What used to be, which is now considered a racial slur or maybe it was always a racial slur what would be considered like an octoroon which is someone who is I guess one sixteenth of something generally you're calling someone that who is mixed blood and you're trying to say that that's in a bad way so generally it's considered a slur um So yeah, the idea that Pauline Hanson would come out even consider talking about true blackness or who is uh, the one true Aboriginal person in regards to arguing against the voice is abhorrent and it really should be condemned by both sides of politics. Unfortunately, the Liberal Party is now currently run by Peter Dutton, who has a long history, including, as much as I don't like being anti-cop, they have not had a good rep among Indigenous communities in Australia's history. So, and he also walked out on the national apology that Kevin Rudd produced in 2008, I believe. Um, so the Liberal Party won't come out and condemn it. The National Party definitely won't. That was never expected. But the Liberal Party, say, under a Malcolm Turnbull, 
or even a Costello, you would have expected that a condemnation would have come out. And I'm happy to be proven wrong. If Peter Dutton has come out in the last week and said, no, that is wrong. It's expected from Pauline Hanson. What you'd expect is for politicians on both sides to come out and say, nah, that's not on. It was not called out. By Did I just skip that? Fuck. Outfit. It was not written about. No. By one media outfit. Do not let no campaign get away with using Trump style politics in Australia. Do not let them divide us. Do not let them divide us. The pro proposed change is constitu constitutionally sound and legally safe. I know it doesn't suit the narrative of the no campaign, but the, the Solicitor General, who was appointed by the now Shadow Attorney General, has given clear advice that recognition through the voice is not just compatible with the system of representative uh, and responsible government, it will enhance it. The which is really important. So what she's saying there is a, is a political statement, which everything she's saying is political statement seeming as she's pretty much staking her role as Indigenous minister. And really, this is going to have a huge impact on whether she gets elected, even as a MP next election, is that the... That's, um... Let's rewind that. 15 seconds. Oh, I remember. So the Solicitor General, who was appointed by the Attorney General of the last parliament, which was a Liberal parliament, run by the LNP. If you remember the last... Um, who was the Eternal Attorney... Yeah. Attorney General, Attorney General, LNP, the guy who got done for, <laughs> he had to quit because he sexually assaulted someone back in, oh shit, Michaela Cash got Attorney General, I don't, I don't even realise that, on ya, on ya, ah, Charles Christian Porter, <laughs> I wonder, I wonder if it was Cash or Porter that appointed the Solicitor General. Through the voice is not just compatible. But what, he, what she's saying is that the Solicitor General, who was appointed by an LNP Attorney General, has deemed that it is constitutionally sound to have recognition in our Constitution for First Nations people with the system of representative uh, and responsible government, it will enhance it. The voice builds on well-established principles and practices and standards of accountability and transparency. It will help improve the quality of government spending, better programs and better outcomes. Friends, friends, Voting yes at this referendum, will we a vote to unify and strengthen Australia? Voting yes will be an act of patriotism, an act of your belief in Australia. First Nations people are Australians. We should be patriotic about them as well. And we can be even greater if we recognise Indigenous Australians. One of the best things about a modern wow. Australia is that so many of us wow. welcome those who come from, from across the sea to make a new life that. here. I see it in my own multicultural community of Barton. We rightly take great pride in welcoming, welcoming waves of migration over the decades. And generation after generation of migrants 
have come to this country because they want a better life for themselves and their family. It is the great Australian story. But not everyone has enjoyed, enjoyed these same opportunities. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have not enjoyed those same opportunities. The gap is not closing. Disadvantage and discrimination persist. The good news is that later this year, we will all get the chance to do something better. Together, we can build a better future that recognises Indigenous, Indigenous Australians' rightful place in our country. A better future that genuinely listens to the needs and aspirations of Indigenous Australians. As the Prime Minister said at Gama last year, in years to come, we'll be able to measure the success of The Voice, not just by the number of people who vote for The Voice, but by the lives that The Voice helps to change, the communities in power, the opportunities it creates, the justice it delivers, the security it will bring to First Nations people around our country. Friends, history is calling. Easy. And I hope more than anything that the answer is yes. Watch. Yes to the Uluru Statement from the heart. Yes to a voice in Parliament. And yes to a, to a better future. I want to conclude by quoting a passage from the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Proportionally, we are the most incarcerated okay. people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are alienated from our families at unprecedented rates. This, is, this cannot be because we have no love for them. Our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people to take a rightful place in our own country. When we have the power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and, they, they, and their culture will be a gift to this country. Friends, it is time. Megali Yahagyu, Baranjara, Manawal. Let's get this done together. Well, thank you so much, Minister. Just um, I'll give you a moment to put your notes down. Um, if I could start um, with uh, uh, what should be a simple question. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, a, a lot of uh, white Australians don't actually have any experience of Indigenous communities. Uh, it's, you know, they, they remain, you know, an isolated and strange phenomenon. Um, I was wondering whether you could just actually uh, describe for our audience, um, you talk about, you know, these better health... So the press club's audience is all uh, white people, just to be just clear. The, the it could be Asian people, Indian people. Of trying just not to get a better health outcome for Indigenous communities now. And secondly, uh, you've talked about how you as Minister would ask um, The Voice to uh, consider health, education, 
jobs and housing. And I just wonder if you could tell us about how you would see uh, the relationship with the minister working. Um, I mean, I, I presume you're not going to be instructing them to do that. You'd be asking them for that. Um, and what sort of levels of advice, you know, obviously you've talked about the local community level, but would it be something where you, that you'd be hoping that the voice could say, these are the sort of trickle down effects of state and federal governments, as well as what a particular individual community might need to get the outcome in that local community? That easy question, Laura. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the what was up with the eyes there? The history there? of the voice has been a very long one, and it is not something that has just fallen out of thin air. I have worked in Aboriginal affairs for forty-four years. And the relationship that I want to have with the voice is a, re a relationship based on respect, based on a very proper way of doing things. And I would be asking the voice and working with the voice on how we would go about setting up that relationship. But the voice, as I have said, is about two things. It's about bringing about those practical outcomes. And uh, as, as Laura has indicated, I've identified the four priority areas that I have. Uh, and I'd be asking the voice about that. But the other thing, of course, is that this is, uh, goes to the first part of Laura's question. The Uluru Statement is an invitation uh, from Aboriginal people to the rest of the country to walk with us. It is an invitation uh, to start this trek across the nation with us. And one of the things that I am really, um, um, I have really noticed after over the past few years uh, that there is an appetite for the truth in this country. I'll cover this one, Sam. There is an appetite sure? Sure, from non-Indigenous sure. Australians, whether they know an Indigenous person or not, to mm -hmm. know the truth, to know where they fit. And the re recognition <laughs> part uh, is about 65,000 years. And that is the story time. of our country. It's not just my story. It's not just Ali Matilda's story. It's not just Aunt Martin's story. It's not like jo just Joy Thomas' yeah, story. It is the story of this country. And that is why I am saying this is so important in unifying in because 65,000 years is unique on this blue planet and is something we all share. Uh, next question is from Jason Oakley. Hello, Mr. Uh, Jason Oakley, NITV, representing Cam Gooley, our voice correspondent. Um, so, yeah, so now is question time. All the media people get up and ask questions about the voice or whatever the topic is in the press club. Thank you for your uh, address today and happy NATO. Happy NATO to you. I think I saw you, Nate, didn't I? You did. You did. Um, look, referendum are difficult, and uh, historically, uh, WA has been a difficult state to get positive results in a referendum. <coughs> but it's likely to be a critical state to win mm -hmm. to get this referendum over the line. <coughs> With the progress and local concerns of the state's modernisation of their cultural heritage legislation, are you concerned that this work will have a neg negative impact on the upcoming referendum? And what do you think needs to happen to get a positive result in WA? Uh, thank you so much for that question. A cultural heritage legislation is a state or territory responsibility. And I make that point very clearly. Uh, I am very, very pleased to see that Ken Wyatt 
uh, has agreed to head up uh, the council that will be dealing with that piece of legislation. I am going over to Western Australia on, I think it's Monday night. Uh, I'll be travelling from Albany right up to Port Hadland. And my aim for Western Australia, my personal aim, is to be an honorary sand groper by the end of this campaign. Minister, I wanted to try and clarify on your four priority areas. Will the voice be completely free to determine its own scope as per the constitutional amendment, or will you as minister expect it to advise on your four priority areas first and foremost? It's a working together and thing. It's not just a unidirectional thing. It's a bi-directional relationship. Uh, the first, last part of your question first, uh, the legislation uh, will be developed after extensive consultation, uh, both with the Aboriginal community and the broader community. And, Drozzi, I know that you're very familiar with that. Uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are worried about the big issues. Uh, as I said, I've been around for a very long time. And the issues of health, education, housing, um, and employment are absolutely fundamental uh, to, uh, to the uh, future direction for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. People are worried about their children's future, about education, about jobs, about medical services. And there hasn't been one community that I've visited that hasn't raised the issue of housing. Josie Douglas, uh, who is a, a wonderful Australian from the Central Land Council, uh, put, it, put it best. Okay. The voice will be changing, changing lives, not changing public policy. Karen Barlow. Hello, Karen. Hello, thank you for your address. Uh, this week, the Canberra we'll Times and the okay. ACM dailies have published a reader's survey of 10,000 people oh. and it's a low yes result, 38%. In the regions uh, in particular, we've, we've, we've got papers in uh, Tasmania and central New South Wales. The result there was 35% yes, in Dubbo, 21%. This result was um, weighted against the national population and it corresponds with national polls. What particular difficulties do you see with the regions? How do you talk to them? What do you say to the regions about the voice? Oh, thank you for what is a really important point. Can I say this? Is my experience and I have travelled extensively, um, and so have people like Marcus and Geraldine and many others in this room. When you have the conversations with people and they get to hear what's important uh, about having a say on uh, issues that affect them, affects them, it is very, very important. I am glad that people want more information uh, that makes me extremely hopeful and it's also extremely appropriate. We are some way out from the referendum. But what I can tell you, I have not caught a plane in the last few months without one or two people uh, giving me a bit of a squeeze or a bit of a smile and a wink. I have not been to a supermarket uh, without people approaching me. The uh, fact that the business community, uh, the union movement, the sporting codes, uh, the faith groups, the ci civil society are supporting this, I believe is the real measure of the level of support out there in the community. And people do want to know what some of the um, information is. But what the two fundamental points to walk away with today is this is about practical difference. 
This is about bringing about practical difference for what everyone agrees are totally unacceptable outcomes for First Peoples in this country. And secondly, it's about that recognition piece. And finally, there are some fantastic websites. I've written this down, voice.gov.au. Have a look at it. Thank you. Tom McElroy. Hi, Tom. G'day, Minister. Thank you for your speech and for taking our questions. You um, broke from your prepared remarks, or at least the released version, to criticise the campaign group Fair Australia today. That group has been taking out full-page ads in some newspapers and online, attacking uh, high-profile business leaders supporting The Voice. Could I ask your reflections on that? And are your comments today uh, a signal that you're going to take a more aggressive approach to what you call misinformation and uh, division sowing? Uh, thank you, Tom, for uh, that question. Look, it's up to Peter Dutton if he wants to tell people what to do. And I'm referring to his comments about the business community. Can I say that I met with the business community yesterday? Um, their support has been long held. It is not something that is new. It's the business business community supports the voice because they know they know that it is about um, employment. It is about uh, making sure that people stay in jobs. It is very much what they're driving through uh, through their their businesses. And I don't think the business community will be very impressed by the bully boy tactics of Peter Dutton. No, they shouldn't be. Anna Henderson. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Anna Henderson from SBS World News. You have really pulled no punches in your criticism of the No campaign, the opposition leader, and those uh, groups which are uh, campaigning against this referendum success. Are you, though, concerned about how that impacts on those everyday Australians who are yet to make up their mind? Do you risk alienating them too? Uh, the answer to that um, is, is that Just as now. people come to understand uh, what this voice is about, those two, two simple propositions of recognition and of practical outcomes they are the key points. People okay. need to understand that misinformation and disinformation is damaging, and I do not apologise. Um, I, I believe that the business community, as I said, is important. Uh, and I will continue to make sure that the um, misinformation and disinformation is understood. But you know what? I have every faith in the Australian community. I have so much faith in the Australian community from what I'm hearing and from what I'm seeing that we are going to have a successful referendum. Melissa Coe. Hi, Minister. Thank you for your speech. Melissa Code from the Mandarin. I wanted to ask a question um, which spoke to both the sort of existential opportunity that the referendum offers us, but then also goes to these practical issues of delivering frank advice in partnership with First Nations um, community. And that was Australia's appetite and sophistication to truly hear uncomfortable things. Um, because surely healing and the anger and hurt that also needs to be reckoned with is a part of that journey. Uh, the government has made it very clear that we support the Uluru Statement in full. Uh, there was a sequence in the Uluru Statement which we're also following. Voice, uh, establishment of a Makarata Commission, that would have the responsibility for agreement making and a national process of truth telling. This country is hungry for the truth. 
there are such amazing oh, examples already in many communities of truth-telling. There are monuments to massacres. The Mile Creek Massacre is a good example. Uh, where uh, the... The idea that we don't learn about these in school is ridiculous because we don't. Absolute massacres. We learn about... We do about two weeks on them. They're not told like that. They're... It was a war. Okay. Yeah. No, it was a massacre. We came in, we killed, we took it. We came, we saw, we conquered. People, the Mile Creek Massacre, I think, took place in 1823, but don't quote me on that. And um, the descendants of those that did the massacring and the descendants of those that, are, that were massacred have come together and built a monument and a walking path overlooking the site of the massacre. It is remarkable. And every long weekend in June, people go out and they uh, re recreate. And one of the beautiful things about it, everyone, is that you take something from your garden or something from your place, some sand, a rock, a leaf, and you place it on the monument, and that makes everyone involved. I'll tell you another, another story which I think is very important and goes very much to the first part of your question. People have made much to me about the lack of bipartisanship. But did you know something? This is about you. This is about you. It's not about those of us that spend some time in that white place. This is my fault. This is about the conscience of the Australian people. This is about the heart and the soul of this nation. And I went to a place called Flinders Island with uh, Bridget Archer who is, uh, of course, a member of the coalition. And she took me to um, a place called Waibalina. I don't know if I've ever been as moved. And part of that story is that that is where the Aboriginal people that were still alive, I think there were about 230 from mainland Tasmania, were put on Flinders Island. Uh, and only 40 survived. But some of the women used to climb to the top of the escarpment and they could see their home from the island. They could see Tasmania. And they stuck feathers to their arms, thinking they could fly home. Of course, they couldn't. But those stories are the story of this country. And there is a thirst for people. And they to should be told. To them. Brett Worthington. Brett Worthington from ABC News. Uh, in Hello. 2019, you spoke at the National Farmers Federation and recalls your experience and Rick Farley's experience of bringing farmers and Indigenous communities together during the native title debates. I'm curious to what extent that's shaping the approach that you're bringing to the voice campaign. Uh, thank you. I, I should give some people some context, I think. Do you, or do you want to? Okay, so Rick Farley was my husband. He uh, died 16 years ago. And many of you, uh, many of you knew him. He was a great Australian. And a lot of Rick's approach and philosophy rubbed off on me. Of course it did. And what I learned very much from Rick is that the best way to get an outcome is through negotiation. It's about listening. It's about understanding that an outcome for everyone is important. I also learned from him we got into a few that, with guys trying to, uh, that to have your feet the firmly on the ground in this country is very important. Judy McIntosh. Most days, he was 
Hello. I'm sure everyone in this room would agree there's overwhelming support for constitutional recognition, but at this stage the same can't be said in terms of the public polling for The Voice. Jeff Kennett, the latest to call today for the Ugh. questions to be split um, when it goes to the people. Tom, Are you open to that idea? And if so not, quickly. does this yeah, risk setting far. back need, the chances of know, constitutional a recognition for oh, a generation? The commitment from the government is very clear. The constitution alteration bill has gone through both houses like of this, parliament. I, I it'll be a bit of a it outlines the question <laughs> and it outlines the, the amendment, the kid uh, amendments for the constitution. The, uh, the, the prime minister has been extraordinarily clear. Not since uh, he, not since uh, the last few months, but over a very long period of time, that we are doing what Aboriginal people have asked us to do, what Aboriginal people have said, and that is to enshrine a voice in the Constitution and to recognise the extraordinary history of this country, and that is very much the way we will be moving forward. Why? That doesn't ask the question is why not just do it as to Josh Butler from the Guardian. Um, to referendums are expensive team, uh, as well, by the way. Campaign. Um, you've talked about misinformation. Referendums are expensive. So are plebiscites. We learnt that. When we had the uh, the gay marriage plebiscite under Malcolm Turnbull, which had no need to be a plebiscite. It could have just been legislated like every other country. Um, it's probably one of the, yeah, that was a problem. You shouldn't have had to have a plebiscite of a gay marriage. It's a waste of money. But constitutional changes require referendums and referendums are expensive. So what, what would have happened if Labour had suggested legislation for two referendums is that the Liberal Party would have gone after them for economic mismanagement and why can't there only be one referendum? That's what would have happened. Mental health organisations have talked about um, the, the impacts already seen on Indigenous people from this debate. Um, uh, both campaigns are accusing the other of sowing division. Things are tense. Um, beyond the result of the vote itself, do you have concerns about ongoing fallout or effects from just having this debate? Um, and whatever the results, there are very strong opinions on both sides. How do you pick up after the referendum and so heal whatever divisions have opened up through this debate? I don't think there's going to be serious divisions uh, from this debate. I have a very deep commitment and a very deep view that Australians will rise to this. I have every faith. And when uh, we think that it's going to be about practical outcomes and recognition, there is nothing to fear in what's being proposed. Uh, we are very conscious of the issues around uh, mental health and just where this debate could go. We've already seen some fairly um, unsavoury things. But I say these things to you, that the Yes campaign is going to be positive, is it's going to be respectful, and it's going to be uh, absolutely about the issues that affect First Nations people. Yep. It will not be about... It's been tasteful so far. We have made the no campaign is. Commitment in the last budget uh, because of the issues that we understand could come. We have had long discussions with Equality Australia, who uh, ran the, the marriage plebiscite, who are extremely, extremely skilled and understand what some of the implica implications are. I have met with all the crisis lines, uh, including 13 Yarn, Lifeline, and many others, and that will be a continuing discussion. I have met with the e-safety commissioner 
about what is possible online and the way in which we will monitor that. So those things have been done proactively and will continue to be done. Jennifer Bishwati. Well, it's a fast car. Thank you, Minister. In your view, what are the real implications of a no vote? What do you mean? If people were to vote no. Uh, uh, my focus is that people will vote yes. Ah. Uh, and us. if they vote no, what, what, will, what will happen? Do you believe? I, I can only repeat what I've said. Sure. Um, we are... Uh, we are... Uh, in the campaign for a yes vote and that is where the focus is that is where my belief is and I believe that's where the Australian people are at Eliza Edward I think you take more damage Hi, um, how soon will Australians find out when they'll head to the polls and you might be loath to get into hypotheticals, um, but what happens to reconciliation if the referendum doesn't succeed? She's not going to answer that. the government pursue any other path to reconciliation yep. in this term of parliament, like treaty negotiations? And as minister, would you want to stay on in the portfolio? Uh, there's three questions in that, so thank you. Uh, the, uh, the, and I'll try and uh, address, address them. But thank you for your questions. Uh, there is much work to do in Aboriginal affairs and I can only say to you that we are contemplating a successful referendum. Uh, the, the commitment to this referendum is full throttled. Uh, the commitment to addressing the practical issues facing Indigenous people uh, is absolute. The commitment to recognising First Peoples in the Constitution is absolutely, absolutely 100%. Uh, so I am not going to deal in hypotheticals. Uh, my role as Minister uh, is a role that I respect, it is a role that I understand, and it is a role where I believe uh, much good work can be done. When will the date be set? Uh, I am the wrong person to ask that question. <laughs> Our final question today is from Dan Jervis Barty. Dan Jervis Barty from West Australia. Hello. A, a big part of the Yes campaign has been to build grassroots support through conversations, in oh. the table conversations, for instance. How do you go about connecting with people, particularly in sort of mortgage belt suburbs, who mightn't have time for kitchen table conversations? They don't have time to read the Karma Langton report. They mightn't have time to even read the newspaper or, or watch the news. They have other things on their mind. How do you intend to connect with people that mightn't have time to connect at all? Well, the first thing I'd like to say, or the first two things I'd like to say, is the number. And this comes up. Um, one of the talking points at the moment around The Voice is that in Australia and globally, we're experiencing massive amounts of inflation and cost of living increases that otherwise haven't particularly been... There's been no major assistance from the government, the Labour government, who's also the proponent to The Voice, there hasn't been a lot of assistance to middle class people, at the very least, around the cost of living. Australia relies heavily on mortgages and the Reserve Bank has increased and increased and increased interest rates to try and curb inflation, which is a fine thing to do, but with the scary thing is, and the thing that people are worried about, is that a lot of people are too busy worrying about inflation, that there's no positive light on the voice issue. And I think not knowing, ignorance, 
and yeah, just having no idea about what the details are of the referendum and what it's actually going to do is a negative. I think more people will vote no than yes, given that they don't, given they don't have any information on hand. That's a big issue for the Australian government at the moment. And it's a talking point at the moment that they've picked the wrong time to have this referendum to get First Nations people recognised and to get a voice to Parliament and rec um, representation for First Nations people in our government. The one priority of this government is precisely what you've outlined. It's the cost of living which was one of the reasons that we're so focused on bringing down the cost of childcare. We're so focused to making sure that paid parental leave is expanded, uh, where there was a, a, a very sizable amount in the budget to ease cost of living pressures. But you know what? Oh shit, we got time. Governments can do two things at once. We can chew gum and we can walk. That uh, is absolutely the case. The uh, connection across uh, mortgage belts, as you've described them, uh, there are thousands of Australians out there. Damn, this fucking car is fast. I uh, may not be aware of, that I'm not aware of. Things like uh, door knocking, things like kitchen table conversations, things like forming. But people don't have groups, time. Things like organising. Uh, organising uh, events in libraries, uh, thing, things like producing material that's not endorsed by me, that's not endorsed by the government, but it suits those local communities. We have thousands of people out there taking the message out, and I can assure you, come referendum day, the message will truly be out there. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Linda Burney for it. Thanks, everyone. Unfortunately, ABC always turns off their uh, and their comments, but that's okay. Um, I thought that was all right. Very political, obviously. She's very, she's got a lot of experience in Indigenous affairs. So she's obviously an Indigenous woman herself. As she said, 44 years in Indigenous affairs. She knows a lot. She knows what Indigenous people want. The idea that they're doing this in a malicious sense is absurd. Um, yeah, I think it was a good talk. Probably could have gone through more detail, and I think that's something that constantly um, is brought up. Do have this. Um, so what I'll say here is, uh, voice to parliament implementation. There is an implementation details. Is it voice.gov.au? A voice. And here you can get implementation details of what will be implemented after the fact. Not necessarily to the exact T, but the models that have been built. The voice will be chosen by Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders. The voice will be representative, gender balanced, and include youth. See if they've got... I don't think I'm going to find it there. Oh. Was it this one? The Guardians are good. 
we Australians together as well. The Guardian is a good, um... A good resource. I think they give a fair and balanced... Um... Fair and balanced takes on The Voice. Probably as editors in the, in the Guardian obviously want The Voice to happen, but there's also a number of people as part of The Guardian that probably want something more than what the current government is proposing. What I'm looking for is the... There is a model that had been put together What are the implementations of the voice to parliament, maybe? I can't see it. Also know that, yes, the United Nations has declared that First Nations people should be recognised. And currently, Australia is not living to that standard that the United Nations has set. We should be. 